Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for another installation of GIA's Knowledge Sessions. This is a series of talks and webinars uh, fueled by GIA's decades of research. We're very lucky at GIA to spend our days studying gemstones, learning about gemstones, and making important discoveries about gems. And it's part of our mission to share all of our discoveries and everything we learn with you. So to kick things off today, my name is Aaron Palkey. I'm a man senior manager of research here at GIA, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you guys today, Wim Bertriest. Wim is a supervisor of field gemology at GIA. He's based in the Bangkok office. And there's not a whole lot of people in the world, I think, who know as much about the gem trade as Wim does. And today, he's gonna share one special aspect of that gem trade, which is ruby treatments. So before we get started though, a little bit of housekeeping. When we start, everybody is automatically muted. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask those questions to us using the Q&A feature, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. I'll be keeping track of the questions as we go along. And so at the end of the, the talk, we'll have some time to spend with Wim, where he can directly answer some of your questions. We'll also send a recording of this presentation to you after the talk later on today. And we also have a survey in that when we'll send that to you so if you have some time, please answer the survey. We'd love to hear what you think about our webinar series. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wim. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, so for today, we have a very exciting topic. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Ruby treatments. Uh, Ruby is an important gemstone and treatments are also important in today's world. Uh, today's world. So the title of this presentation that I chose is Furnaces, Fluxes, and Filling, because those three words cover most of the ruby treatment. And if you're not familiar with these words, we'll learn about them more later during the presentation. So I think before we dive into the subject of rubies themselves, I want to start with the question, why do we do treatment? Why is treatment necessary in the gem trade? Now, of course, if you're a miner and you go to your mine and you start digging, this is what you hope to find after a hard day of work. A nice handful of clean, well-colored, big stones, rubies preferably. Unfortunately, when you spend your day mining in a ruby mine, this is more what you will find. So there is a lot of material that doesn't really have a use if you look at it in first sight. There's a lot of material that is heavily cracked, that is off color, that is not as clean, that has low transparency. So if you look at basically, um, if you make a graph of the qualities that come out of a mine, the high quality gems only represent a very tiny fraction of the amount of gems that you actually find. So the majority of material is actually of lower grade. And if you look at it that way, you could see that high quality gems are basically a byproduct of low grade gems mining. So you need to find a lot of these low grade gems, a lot of B grade, a lot of gravel quality gems before you can actually find that high quality gem that everyone is looking for. So if there is no market for these low grade gems who, that represent the bulk of the mining, the, the mining will stop. I mean, a miner will only find a gem quality material that doesn't need treatment once in a while. But of course you cannot keep living on that 1% of material. So you need a market for that lower grade material. You need ways to make money of that. And in this image that you can see, this is production from a sapphire mine in Western Thailand. You can actually see that all of this is considered good quality, uh, the, the gem quality material, but you see that only a very tiny fraction of it is actually blue. And even in that blue section that was taken out of there, you see that some of the stones are still a little bit too dark, so they still need treatment to be optimized. So treatment is one way to valorize that lower grade material, to actually make a profit on that low grade material, to keep your mine running based on that low grade material before you can actually find those high grade gems that we are all after. Now, of course, if we're talking about treatment, one word we have to address is disclosure. I think everyone can understand that treatment is necessary to keep the gemstone supply alive. If you don't 
if you're not able to treat those stones that you find most of them in the gemstone mines, you will not be able to find the high quality stones. So if, the, um, if there is no market, no treatment that can optimize those lower quality stones, the high grade stones will not be found. Now, of course, treatment has to be disclosed. Um, undisclosed treatment is not acceptable. There's a couple of reasons for that. I think one reason is everyone who works with gemstones realizes that rarity is an important factor in evaluating high-end gemstones. So we all understand that untreated stones are rarer than treated stones. So the fact that there is gonna be a value difference, whether that is a perceived value di difference or actual money di difference, it is there. So it is important to disclose any treatment that has happened on the stone. A second fact is the, the care and durability. Some stones are treated and not all treatments are that stable. Some stones, some treatments might affect the durability of a stone or um, you have to be careful which processes you put them into, especially when you're talking about jewelry manufacturing or jewelry cleaning. Not all cleaners are suitable for all treated stones. Some um, some processes you can do on an untreated stone, but you wouldn't want to do those on a treated stone. So it's important to know when a stone is treated. So that brings us to the ruby treatments. Ruby treatments, we're going to go over a few of the treatments. Of course, there's other treatments that we cannot discuss today. So I'm going to focus on a few of the highlights and the most important ones. Now, the first one that I want to bring up, it's not the most common one. But I want you to be aware of this one because we're starting to see more and more of it and people are becoming more aware of this treatment in rubies. And that is oiling and dyeing. Now, if you look at the whole gemstone supply chain, a lot of the rough gemstones, they are treated with oil when they are studied in the rough by traders. Like here you can see Dr. Aaron Palki, he's looking at some stones in an office in Thailand and you can see there's a whole lot of things on the on the desk there's tweezers there's a loop there's a portable scale there's a fixed scale the dark field loop parcels of rough parcels of cut stone on the table but here on the side you can also see a bottle of baby oil and that baby oil is used for when a parcel of rough gems is studied it reduces the reflections and gives you a clearer view of the internal world of crystals um, that you can find inside those gemstones. And it's not only in those offices that you find it. If you go to the biggest ruby auction in the world, the Gemfields Ruby Auction that takes place in Singapore, there is a bottle of that oil on every table because it makes it easier to study the rough gemstones and to look at the internal zoning, the internal characteristics of a ruby. Now, of course, some of that oil might stick into the rough stone, might penetrate into a fracture. So it might be possible that you find it even after cutting, which will cloud a fracture, will hide a fracture, and will actually improve the appearance of a stone, much like we see that in emeralds, where oiling is very common. Of course, if you, you can do it with, if oil can penetrate into your stone, you can also use a colored oil, and then you get into the realm of dyeing. You're actually improving the color as well, apart from the transparency. So especially in Southeast Asia, there are different brands of this oil. You have here the Crown Rubies Red Star Oil. I think another brand popular in Myanmar is the uh, Red King Ruby Oil. Um, where people use it to enhance the appearance, again, of rough gems to make it better to study. But of course, when it's uh, colored oil, it also makes the stones look better color-wise than they actually are. Now, unfortunately, they're fairly easy to recognize. I think this is an amazing photo where you can actually see a cavity filled with oil with a gas bubble in there. So it's very similar to what you see in emerald treatments. And it is happening in rubies as well. So we're starting to see it more and more. I'm not going to say that you're seeing this every day, and you don't even that I see this every day, but people are becoming more aware of this because this treatment is not very stable. The oil washes out pretty quickly, so it can have a big impact on your stone. Now let's move to the big ones for Ruby. Um, the previous one didn't require heat treatment. The next, um, the next topics that we'll discuss all involve heat treatment. So if we talk about heat treatment, we can go back to the beginnings. When we talk about traditional heat treatment of corundum, what we think about is the classic Sri Lankan technique. 
where they use blowpipes. Um, this technique is used on stones where they want to reduce a blue color component in corundum. So they do it on very dark over blue sapphires to make it a more attractive blue. You can do it on stones that are very pale blue or very uneven pale blue to make colorless sapphire out of them that were commonly used as a diamond simulant. You can do this on pink sapphire that have some blue zones to remove those blue zones and create a pure pink. You get the idea. You get rid of some blue with this treatment. And this treatment is very old. Almost 800 years ago, this treatment was already described by an Arab scholar by the name of Al-Tefashi. So we already described that Sri Lankan traders, Sri Lankan treaters, were using this blowpipe, using charcoal to reduce and alter the color in sapphires. So that's nothing new, but of course we're talking about sapphires here mainly. Um, the technique that they're using here is that they feed wood or coconut charcoal into a fire constantly. So the stone itself is inside that tiny pot, packed in a little bit of clay, but inside those coals. And they constantly keep feeding charcoal, so fuel to it, and also constantly blowing air through that blowpipe. But you see it's not isolated, it's an open fire, the heat readily escapes, and you need to constantly keep adding air. It is just air because they blow it in there. So it's very rudimentary, there's a lot of uh, potential for improvement on this technique. But it works very well for the stones that they traditionally use it for. Now let's take a little trip to another place in the world because we're going from Sri Lanka to a place in Thailand. A place in Thailand, Eastern Thailand, a city called Chantaburi. Chantaburi, which is also called the ruby treatment capital of the world. Uh, the people in Chantaburi are very experienced ruby traders, but they're also pioneers in many of the treatments that we commonly see in the market nowadays. So there's a lot of discussion and a lot of ideas about the origin of heat treatment in Chantaburi. Why did it actually start there? There are people that say there are legends of people that left stones in dopping flames when they were doing at the lapidary shop and they got heated in those flames. That's not very likely because those flames don't get very hot. There is another theory that expertise might have come through French occupation. Chandaburi has been occupied by the French in the late 1890s, which is also the same period that Verneuil was developing synthetic ruby development. So it was a lot of breakthroughs in the understanding of ruby formation at higher temperatures. So maybe there was some experimentation going on with treating natural rubies as well. Then another story that is commonly heard is the Chantaburi fire. In 1967, a huge fire destroyed a lot of gem dealers' houses in Chantaburi, where really the, in the street where most of the important gem dealers lived. And of course, out of the smoking pile of rubble, people went back to retrieve their stones because they would survive the fire. But people noticed that their stones looked a little better. So they started experimenting like, okay, maybe there's this heat, this fire improved the stones. And they started experimenting with that. It is um, very hard to verify which one of these stories it actually is. But what we can definitely say is that the Vietnam War as they call it in the US, the American war, as they call it in Vietnam, had an impact on that development. So to go a little bit back there, so in the mid 19, since the 1950s, 1970s, there's this massive conflict in Southeast Asia where Thailand is a main ally of the US. So the US based a lot of their um, flight operations, a lot of their airports based in Thailand, which of course is, um, supported by a huge military investment, but also an economic investment. And it's estimated that several billions of US dollars were pumped into the Thai economy. There's 50,000 US military personnel that are based in Thailand, a lot of them spending their recreational leave in Thailand, which helped build up the tourism industry that we now know in Thailand, but also a lot of industries to support the military. So Thailand was very rapidly exposed to a lot of new technology and had very easy access to it. Plus, with all that money being available, people could uh, get their hands on that technology fairly easily. So because they had access to that new technology, they could um, develop new furnaces. 
So that new technology, one of the things they could use was refractory bricks to keep temperature stable. Like if you remember that Sri Lankan technique, that was just an open fire. If you can control that fire, keep the heat in, you're able to build up higher temperatures. So you're able to heat treat at more extreme conditions. Another technological advantage is that you have access to high temperature fuels. You have access to industrial coke used in steel development. So that they can get a lot higher temperatures than you can get with that charcoal made out of coconut or just wood. Uh, you can also have access to different fuels. You can have the combination of different hydrocarbons and gases to really, like you can pump pure oxygen in there. You can blow more air in there to get a hotter flame to reach higher temperatures. So that just allows you to expand your capacities a lot more. And then of course, if you go a little further in time, a little uh, even more modern, the next step is gonna be electrical heating. Electrical heating has a lot of advantages. This is an electric furnace. Um, it has very precise temperature control. It has a display and you can tell it, set temperature at 1,453 degrees and it will do it. And it will stay at that temperature. Another advantage is that as long as it's plugged in, it has endless energy. While the other, um, the other techniques, sometimes you are limited, like you have to enter an amount of fuel and once it's burned out, your heat treatment run is over. While here, as long as it's plugged in, as long as you keep electricity on, as long as you keep your heating element on, you can keep treating. So you can heat treat for hours, for days at a constant, very high temperature using this equipment. So this is all what we consider, consider still traditional heat treatment. So con the conditions of traditional heat treatment can be in various atmospheres, but most of the time it's oxidizing. Like you can create it in reducing atmosphere, but for rubies, that's not commonly done. Most of that is applied for sapphires. We'll do that in another talk when we discuss sapphire treatments. But most of it is just done in air, air which has a significant oxygen component. So it's mostly an oxidizing environment. The temperatures range from very low to very high. I think the maximum limit of those electric furnaces is around 1,800. That's the temperature where your actual furnace starts breaking down. Your sapphires and rubies could probably survive higher temperatures, but your furnace simply would not. So you have that low temperature when we're talking temperatures below 1,200 degrees and then higher temperatures when we're between 1,002 and 1,800 degrees. And it's that temperature that uh, rubies are treated at that can have a very strong effect on inclusions. Another point I wanna um, make here is that during this treatment, there are no chemicals added. So this is just, you put the stones in the crucible, put them in the furnace, crank up the heat and wait until the treatment's over. You don't add any powders or any mixtures uh, with the stones. It's just the stones clean in the oven, no added chemicals. Now this is an example of this traditional heat treatment where people, where they have um, heat treated half a parcel of Thai ruby, Thai Siamese ruby. These are actually from the Cambodian side of the border. But you can see that the color drastically improved with this heat treatment at fairly high temperatures, but without adding those chemicals. So on the left side, you see before, you can see those are a bit more purplish, a bit more brownish. While on the right-hand side, you can see they're the bright color, very desirable, very attractive uh, parcel of rough. But it is heat treated at higher temperatures, but without any added chemicals. Now to detect it, um, those higher temperatures, you can mainly look at silk. I use this photo of a sapphire, but the same exact concept applies for ruby, where you can see there's beautiful silk here, those nice needles, those particles. This is a photo before treatment. So before treatment, you can see nice intact layers. But if you heat treat this at high temperatures, high temperatures defined temperatures over 1,200 degrees, I think this particular stone, we have heat treated it at 1,500 degrees the stone will look like this. So the inclusion scene has completely changed. You see those needles partially dissolved. They became what we call peppered needles. They're chopped into little bits. They're partially dissolved. So it looks very different. So if you see this kind of pattern in ruby or in sapphire, it's indicative for treatment at higher temperatures. Now something else you can focus on are crystal inclusions. Now crystal inclusions can alter at 
any given temperature. It depends on your crystal, it depends on the pressure, it depends on the stone. So it's very unpredictable how a crystal will react. Some crystals start changing at temperatures of only 600 degrees, others remain unchanged at temperatures over 1,500. But here you see a nice black opaque metal sulfide crystal. And we've treated it at a temperature of 800 degrees, 800 degrees, which is considered very low for ruby treatment. But you see that this crystal developed this massive fracture that completely got filled in with black opaque material. And if you look at the back, like it's happening in the background here, there was this tiny crystal here before treatment. And after treatment, it formed this, in, this in expansion crack. So those expansion fractures, they're also very indicative of treatment. But it's not because you don't see them that it hasn't been treated, because the treatment reaction of these crystals is very unpredictable. Now, of course, if you see something like this, a fracture with a, what we call a snowball inclusion, an inclusion that has been heated at such extreme conditions, at such high temperatures, that it completely disintegrated and became this white blob that resembles a snowball, that is, of course, an indicator of very extreme treatment conditions, usually at very high temperatures for an extended amount of time. Now, when we're talking traditional heat treatment, I've shown you a lot of extreme examples, especially that last one. But in recent years, we've seen a trend where the people go back to basics. People are using all this modern setup, but they're using the, uh, the same, the same uh, mindset that the uh, Sri Lankan technique that, we know, that has been known for centuries where they work at these lower temperatures in air, they're using the exact same conditions in the modern ovens to heat treat Mozambican ruby. And why do they do that? Again, to remove those subtle blue zones. You see it here on top, the one on the left is before treatment, the one on the right is after treatment. You have this subtle blue zone that becomes less pronounced after that treatment at 800 degrees for 160 minutes. So for a little more than two hours at 800 degrees, very low temperature. So detecting this treatment is very challenging and you often need to rely on higher, um, on advanced technology for this. Uh, this is another example how you can see that these blue patches, subtle blue patches were removed using this century old technique, but just using the modern equipment. Um, now, if you look for the detection criteria for this treatment, if you look at with a microscope, a lot of the Mozambican rubies where most of this treatment is applied to show these platelets. These platelets consist of two parts. You have a very bright part and then a more subtle, less pronounced part. But in that more subtle platelet, that is where you start developing spots after treatment at fairly low temperature. So if you see those spots, it's a very good indication for low temperature treatment. However, they are very difficult to actually observe and even more difficult to photograph. And I'm gonna use the following stone as an example. This is a piece of ruby that we fabricated into a wafer. So we have one window on top, one window on the bottom. We're looking straight through the stone and you can, I think everyone can agree, this is a very clean stone. You have a, a very subtle fracture going on here a tiny fracture on one of the sides here, but for the rest it looks clean. But then if you use a fiber optic light and you angle it in the right way, this is what shows up. So you see that this stone is actually full of platelets, which we didn't see in the beginning, but if you use the correct lighting, you see a lot of these platelets and they can be very helpful for treatment, especially low temperature heat treatment detection in Mozambican rubies especially. Now I've mentioned that advanced technology is very important as well, um, especially when we're looking at a technique called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FTIR for friends. So that um, basically sends wavelengths through a stone and the absorption of certain wavelengths in the far infrared will tell you something about the presence of certain mineral species in the stone, OH groups, uh, it's very sensitive to OH groups, so a lot of organic uh, chemicals are picked up. So also very handy to pick up oils, resins, which, with, which people are probably familiar with again from um, the emerald industry. But we also use it for corundum treatment detection. So before heating, 
almost all Mozambican rubies show this peak at 3309. A 3309, this one's here. And after heating, a lot of the rubies develop what we call a 3309 series. So two additional peaks, one at 3232 and one at 3185 develop. And when you see that series of those three peaks, that is a very strong indication that the stone has been heat treated at lower temperatures. But you can also see that this peak at 3309, it decreased in intensity. So the peak becomes less subtle. So you only see this pattern develop when your peak at 3309 was strong enough before heat treatment. This is another example where we have here, the one on top is the one before heating, where you see that the 3309 peak is not that expressed and you see that it decreased after heating, but we don't see any sign of those two other peaks. So it's not because you don't see those patterns, you don't see those additional peaks, that it's not been heat treated. However, the presence of those peaks is very indicative. So this is all still traditional heat treatment, traditional heat treatment without any added chemicals, just increasing the temperature when you treat those stones. Now, if you submit a stone that has been treated in this way, this is what you'll get back on a GIA um, Ruby report. So it will say that the species is going to be natural corundum, the variety is going to be ruby, depending on whether or not you requested it, you will get the geographic origin as well. And treatment will simply say heated. There is no comment about durability because the durability um, of the stone is not really affected by this treatment. So this is how you recognize this treatment on a GIA colored stone report. Now, of course, there are other heat treatments uh, procedures out there. The next one I want to discuss is that one that we refer to as flux healing. Now, flux healing, we have to go back a little bit um, to one specific time. In 1992, a new ruby deposit was discovered in northeastern Myanmar. Um, this ruby deposit was instrumental in the development of this treatment, well, at least in the popularization of this treatment. So this is the Mongshu deposit that brought a lot of rubies into the market. Most of them came through the border markets in Thailand because at that time, Myanmar was still fairly closed. So a lot of the stones were brought to the border and were then bought by traders, treaters at the Thai side of the brought to Chanaburi for treatment, then brought to Bangkok for um, further sale into the international market. Now, most of this material is fairly small in size, but that is actually a good thing because you have a huge volume in small sizes, which makes it very suitable for calibrated sizes. You can cut huge amounts of five by three ovals, of uh, six by eight uh, baguettes, so a lot of these stones were cut from Mongshu rubies. And in the 90s, huge volumes of these stones came out, but they were all treated in this method called flux healing. Now, of course, when you have this huge supply of stones, there are some challenges with it that cannot be denied. So the first Mongshu ruby challenge is that a lot of the rough has this very dark blue core. So you can see this hexagonal outline of this very dark blue which really makes the stone too dark. So you need something to reduce that blue color. Now, fortunately, with traditional heat treatment at high temperature, so if you don't add any chemicals, but you use high temperature, you're able to get rid of that core. Like you see here, there's still some zoning going on, but that blue core has completely disappeared after treatment. So by just increasing the temperature, you get rid of that blue color zone, that blue core in Mongshu rubies. Now, the second challenge that these stones have, they have a lot of fractures. Well, a lot of fractures um, that reach the surface, and these can be healed by heating them with flux. So we'll go a little bit in deeper into that process about heating with flux. Now, of course, flux is not an uncommon thing in the jewelry industry. I want to disclose that this is not my area of expertise, so if I make any rookie mistakes here, please forgive me or feel free to correct me in the comments. Um, the use of flux in the jewelry industry, especially in jewelry manufacturing, people are using flux a lot. 
You use flux to coat your jewelry that will protect it from oxidation when it is being assembled or repaired. So when you basically put the torch on it, but also fluxes allow a better flow of solder and a better control of solder when you're assembling or repairing pieces. Now, of course, there are different types of flux. There are a lot of professional fluxes uh, perfectly tailored to whatever metal combination that you're using. Um, but borax is and has been commonly used um, as a cheap alternative. It is widely available. It has been known for a long time that it is a very effective flux. Um, and there are some stories from decades ago that gem corundum that was set in jewelry was accidentally healed after the jewelry was repaired. Now we're mainly talking about black star sapphires, which have a tendency to part, um, so to separate along planes, and those parting planes became healed after they, the jewelry they were setting was repaired. They didn't fully understand what was going on, so this treatment was probably done maybe accidentally, maybe on purpose before that, but it is the discovery of that Meng Shu material that really made this treatment popular. Now, if we look at the more technical side, what is, what is a flux actually? Now a flux, when a material comes in contact with a flux, the material will dissolve into the flux. So the material will continue dissolving into the flux until the flux is saturated with that material. And that saturation point, it depends on temperature. So the higher temperature you're working at, the more material can be dissolved in the flux, so the higher your solution capacity. And once your flux is saturated, it will start depositing the material again at the same uh, rate that it is dissolving it. So it becomes in this equilibrium, but it's not exactly, it doesn't stop dissolving. It starts depositing at the same rate that it is dissolving. So it stays very stable, it looks at the same, but it is actually constantly moving mass around. Now to make this a bit more visual, I think salt in water is a good example. Because you don't melt the salt in water, the, water uh, the salt dissolves in it. So water is a flux for that salt and you can keep adding salt until it stops dissolving. Um, but it actually doesn't stop dissolving. It's still dissolving, but it's also depositing at the same time. And I think we're all familiar with the fact that in hot water you can dissolve more salt. So this is a very good analogy for the flux. Now, if we apply this to Ruby, let's take a look at our Ruby. Here's a sketch of a Ruby. We have a Ruby with a surface reaching fracture. And this is what we start with. So in the next step, we will coat the material in flux. Flux usually, let's take borax as an example. So we coat it in borax, we put it in the furnace, we start increasing heat. So your flux starts to melt and is able to penetrate really into those, um, into those fractures and it starts dissolving corundum there. Because it is in this liquid state, it is able to absorb that corundum, take it out and take it into the flux. Now borax starts melting at temperatures of 740 Celsius, but usually this is done at way higher temperatures. Now, if you increase the temperature, you will increase the amount of corundum that can be dissolved. And when the amount of, when you reach saturation, corundum is being dissolved from the side of your fracture, goes into the flux, and then is deposited at the same time. Now, the place where it's deposited is usually focused at the tip, the narrowest point. So you basically start going, you start depositing corundum here in the tip of the fracture, and you start moving and closing that fracture as long as you have flux available, as long as you're at the right temperatures. Now, of course, you cannot keep this going forever. So, but while you cool, your flux will cool as well. Your flux is not capable of, um, of holding all that corundum anymore. So it expels all the leftover corundum and crystallizes. Of course, when this all crystallizes, some of the flux get trapped. Maybe some air bubbles that were in the fracture, they also get trapped. So that is what we call a healed fracture. Now, of course, you can ask yourself, like, why wasn't this developed sooner? Like, why didn't, because corundum rubies with fractures have been around for centuries. 
borax has been used for a long time. Why is this so new? Why did we have to wait for the discovery of that Meng Shu material less than 30 years ago for this treatment to become so popular? And I think part of the answer lies in the fact of that technological revolution. So I think if you look at one of the store shelves of a supply store in Chantaburi in the late 1980s, you can see that there is a huge amount of chemicals just available in the store there. So you can just go to the store, buy borax, buy different kinds of fluxes and start experimenting with it. But I think most important of all is that new technology of ovens where you have electronic ovens that allow you to work at optimal conditions for this treatment. So you can go to very high temperatures which means that your flux can do a lot of work, but you can also stay at those temperatures for a very long time, basically as long as you want, which was not possible to work in that controlled environment with controlled temperature um, and for those long periods with the traditional fuel powered ovens. So those electric ovens were really important in developing this treatment. Now, of course, detecting this, um, you're basically looking for the remnants of those fractures, those healed fractures. They have what we call fingerprints. They are very similar to natural fingerprints. They even look a lot like flux grown synthetic rubies. But usually when you see this in natural stones, the amount of fractures that you observe is just so massive. There are so many of these fractures that are healed that it becomes pretty obvious that this is a healed fracture. The healed fractures can have various appearance. Like here you can see one where there's a lot of isolated droplets. This is an example where it's more elongated, more channels of trapped flux in there. Um, but those healed fractures, that is what you're looking for if you want to identify flux healed rubies. Now, I mentioned that Meng Shu rubies is where it all started, but nowadays it is done on a lot of other rubies as well. A lot of rubies from Mozambique are treated with flux. A lot of the rubies coming from Greenland, I say virtually all of them, are treated with flux because to address those um, clarity issues, to address those fractures. And of course, there's still a lot of the Meng Shu ruby around. So you still see it in those rubies as well. But a lot of other um, sources also are being flux healed. Now, if you bring a flux healed stone to GIA, this is what the report will say. So the species will still be natural corundum. The variety will still be ruby. Geographic origin is given whether you, um, if you requested that, if you didn't request it, this line will be omitted. But the treat under the treatment section, it will say heated with the comment minor residues. It could be minor, it could be major, that depends on the amount of residue. But with residue, we mean the healed fractures, how much material is still trapped in there. Do we see remnants of flux as those residues in the fractures? So that's what it will say on the report. Now, this was a very brief summary. If you want to take some time to look at this, uh, the process of fracture healing of Ruby, I recommend to look at this article by Richard Hughes and John Emmett. Uh, this article won prizes about 15 years ago. Excellent summary of the impact of this treatment on stones, how the treatment is being done, how to identify it. Um, so look this, internet, uh, look this up. You can find it online for free. Um, it's a very good resource if you want to know more about fracture healing of rubies. Now, the third tr uh, heat treatment that I want to discuss is glass filling. Glass filling is, um, I hope most of you have heard from it. If not, we will talk about it now. So glass filling has been around for a while. Um, you know that ruby rough is extremely valuable, but a lot of ruby rough is also very irregular, which means that when you cut it, sometimes there are cavities in the pavilion. This is something that if you looked at, especially older cuts of rubies, um, that you see cavities in that pavilion. In the 80s, some people have started filling these cavities with glass just to make them less obvious um, and maybe add a little bit of weight also. Um, so that's something that we've been seeing for a while, of, although it only became really popular in the last decades with the arrival of new material. But like in the classic sources like Thai rubies, like Burmese rubies, that rough is so irregular that there's often cavities in the cut stone. So they just patch it up, put a little bit of glass in there, all fixed. 
Now, clarity enhancement with glass filling that we're seeing nowadays, I mean, I think it speaks for itself. You have fractures and you fill them with glass during heat treatment. Why do you need the heat treatment? Basically to liquefy the glass, to make it flow into the fractures. And then when it solidifies again, when it's cooled, it uh, becomes a solid again and your fracture is completely filled with glass and it's less visible. So you use a glass with a refractive index that is similar to corundum. Why is that? Because then you will not notice the fracture anymore. It will completely blend with the ruby. Now, of course, these glasses, they can be colored. Um, traditionally, colorless glasses used, but we've seen the use of colored glass where people use cobalt colored glass that is uh, blue. So you can turn your stone blue with it, but you can also dye it red or other, any other colors. Because you want a glass with an RI that is similar to corundum, you need a very high RI, and you can do that by adding a lot of lead to your glass. So you're making this lead glass um, that we see commonly right now. Unfortunately, those glasses, especially those high lead glasses, they're not that durable. They're pretty soft. They're not that chemically resistant. So there's a big contrast there with corundum. Corundum, which is an extremely hard mineral. Corundum, which is very resistant to a lot of acid. So it's a very good gemstone, but that glass does not have the same properties. Now, this is an example of the material that people are using nowadays to glass fill. So you see, it's not the most attractive rough. You see they're obviously corundum crystals, uh, but they're not transparent because there are so many fractures. The color doesn't really come out because they are that opaque. But if you heat treat them with an add lead glass, so you glass fill them, this will be the result. So you see there's more color, although the glass is colorless. Um, and you see that all of those crystals, they're covered with this glassy material. That is just glass on the surface. So people do this in the rough. So a lot of the material is completely covered in glass and you cut the stones from this rough, but it will, you see that the color has drastically improved. The transparency has improved. So it has a very big impact on the stones doing this treatment. Unfortunately for us, uh, fortunately for us, it is very easy to identify these, uh, these treatments. The first thing you look at is colored flashes. So all these colored flashes that you see in this stone, those are actually filled fractures. Usually the color flashes are blue, but you have them sometimes yellow, sometimes orange, but blue is most common. And those are at the, the contact of the glass and the corundum in the fracture. Another obvious feature that you see in there are gas bubbles. Gas bubbles that we see in all kinds of glass. Um, but in those fractures that are filled with glass, air bubbles get trapped in there and they're very obvious in those fractures. So in this stone, you see a combination of natural features. Like here in the back, you have some, uh, some tubes, you have some natural fingerprints, but you also have those very nice rounded spherical gas bubbles all over the place. Plus the fact that there's these colored flashes running through it, very typical classic for a glass filled ruby. Now, probably the easiest way to look at it, because this you can just do with a loop, is look at the surface of a stone. Look at the surface of a stone in reflected light. This is the table of a glass filled ruby. And you can see here the difference in durability um, between those different materials. You can see here, there's material, there's this part has very strong polish lines because it is much softer than the surrounding corundum. The corundum is perfectly polished, but this material here, a lot of polish lines, these black holes, they're just pits, they're gas bubbles that were cut in half and now there's just a pit there. So you can very easily identify it by looking at the surface and just looking at the different textures um, that you see on the facets. Now, just to give you an example about durability, like I've mentioned, this glass is not as stable as corundum. Um, I'm gonna use this example that I saw on social media a few years back, and it is still one of the most striking examples highlighting the durability or the lack of durability of glass-filled rubies. These images come from a jeweler in Colorado called Boyd Fox, and he let me use these photos. So he got this stone in his workshop from someone and he suspected it to be glass filled ruby. He was probably able to identify it, but he was able to convince our client that this stone is not as valuable as they thought. And 
the client allowed him to do some tests on it and he proposed, let's see what this stone would look like without the glass. Let's get rid of all the glass. So what he did is he put it in acid to get rid of all the glass and look, take a good look again at the first stone, that first ruby that came out with an attractive color. It's an okay size. It's not a bad stone, but this is what the stone looks like without glass. So you can see the huge impact that this treatment can have on the appearance of a stone. Plus the fact that this treatment is not very uh, stable means that it is very important that this treatment is always disclosed and that every gemologist is able to identify this treatment correctly because it has such a big impact on the stone. Now, if you submit a stone like that to GIA, you will still get um, the species natural corundum variety ruby. And it will say it's heated because it has to go to higher temperatures to be able to absorb that glass. But it says clarity enhanced with lead glass. So clarity enhanced means that your, your fractures become less obvious and there is lead glass in there. Um, it also comes with a comment that this fracture filling material may be unstable at elevated temperatures. Elevated temperatures, which are pretty common during jewelry manufacturing, chemical agents also very common during jewelry cleaning, but also manufacturing. So it is very important to be aware of this treatment. Now, of course, you can push this treatment very far. You can go crazy with the amount of glass that you put in there. And sometimes it goes so far that you cannot consider it a ruby anymore. So in that case, we call it the species is going to be a manufactured product. And then we have the common that a manufactured product consisting of lead glass and ruby, because sometimes there's so much lead glass in it that if you remove the lead glass, you're just going to be left with a few crumbs of ruby. We cannot call that a ruby anymore. So that is a manufactured product. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about glass filling, there's an excellent article by Vincent Pardieu on lead glass filled rubies, where he describes the whole process of treatment step by step, going from looking at the rough, cleaning the rough, putting it in the oven, all the way to the faceted stones. Um, I think you can find it as a PDF online. And then there's also an excellent GIA article that focuses as well on the identification and the durability of these lead glass filled rubies. You can find that in the Gems and Gemology Spring 2006 edition. All Gems and Gemology editions are freely available on GIA's website. So take a look there. Just look for the Spring 2006 edition. There's some beautiful images in there. Very helpful if you want to know a little bit more about this. So we've, looked, we've discussed a lot of treatments really in a, at a fast pace. So I hope everyone was able to follow. So I'm gonna um, summarize it a little bit. I think the first thing we need to summarize is treatment is necessary. The need to treat is there because treatment makes a larger part of the production available to the market. Yes, it may be at a reduced price point. Yes, it may be with durability issues, but as long as that is disclosed, that shouldn't be a problem. There should be a market for it. So I think here again, disclosure is very important. There is nothing wrong with a treated stone. There is a lot wrong with selling a treated stone, not saying that it's treated. And then last to close, I wanna use this graph to summarize everything I've said about heat treatment um, of rubies. So we have basically have the three types. We have what we call traditional heating with no added chemicals. Then we have the flux healing and the glass filling. So the goal of these treatments for traditional heating, it is to improve the color. That's it. The flux healing is mainly to improve the transparency, but because you do it at such a high temperature, the side effect is that it can also improve the color. Now glass filling is mainly targeted at improving transparency and making the color more obvious. Now, are these, are these treatments, uh, heat treatments, all three of them, yes. So all three of them have happened in a furnace, in an oven at elevated temperatures. At which temperatures? Traditional heat treatment, you can do it at a range of temperatures, low to high. Flux healing almost always happens at higher temperatures because that is the environment where your flux can do most of its work. Now glass filling can happen at lower temperatures, higher temperatures. It's not exactly clear. There's, um, there's a range of temperatures noted. Some people say it can happen as low as 900. But of course, if you increase the temperature, it will increase the fluidity of your glass and your glass will be able to penetrate faster. 
Now, the durability of stones treated in this way, for traditional heat treatment and flux treated, the durability is not affected. It still remains a natural ruby uh, corundum, so it is very resistant to chemicals. It is very resistant to abrasion because it is so hard and tough. Glass filled material is a different story. There the durability is greatly reduced because of the presence of this soft um, and chemically fairly weak glass, especially when we're talking about lead glasses. Now, how do I identify those visually? Traditional heating, you almost always go on the alteration of inclusions. Different inclusions, you can go for the silk, you can go for crystals, but crystals have a very unpredictable behavior. So you don't know at which temperature they'll start reacting. For flux healing, you go looking for those healed fractures. They're gonna be the most obvious, they're gonna be all over the place in most flux healed rubies. But you can also see altered inclusions because those stones have been treated at high temperatures. Now for glass filling, there's a couple of things you need to look for. I think first things you would look for in a microscope would be those, the presence of those gas bubbles. Um, but then just with a loop, you would see those surface contrasts where you have those contrasts between the tough corundum and the weaker glass. So there's more polished lines, it abrades easier. There's even pits where gas bubbles were cut. You have the color flashes in the filled um, fractures that become obvious under the microscope, but you can also see some altered inclusions because this stone has been subjected to higher temperature treatment. So you can see some altered crystals. Maybe your crystal has formed that tension fracture around it. Maybe the silk has altered a little bit, but usually it's not gonna be the first thing you see because those gas bubbles, color flashes are gonna be so obvious. So I know this was a lot of information. Um, Ruby heat treatment is very interesting. Ruby treatment in general. I know I focused only mainly on heat treatment here. There are other topics. There are other treatments that are being done. Maybe we can cover those in another topic because we only have an hour. And I did want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I think now we have some time for questions or if people want me to repeat a part. Thanks, Wim. That was really great. A lot of good information there. And we have a lot of questions, so people were paying attention. And I think, I think they really liked your talk. So um, right. let's start off with a couple softball questions, all right? So um, Valerie Murray Title asks, does heat treatment result in a permanent change? Yes. Um, <clears throat> of course, when you talk heat treatment, I think here again, it's important to make the distinction between the treatments that are that affect the durability and not, but generally heat treatment is permanent. It will not turn back to its original state. Of course, be careful with that glass filled material because that glass that is in the stones can be removed. So in a sense, that one is reversible, but typically a ruby that is heat treated is stable. So another question from an anonymous attendee is, uh, regarding the use of FTIR to identify low temperature heat treatment, specifically for the Mozambican rubies, as you mentioned. And the question mm -hmm. is, what's the likely transition temperature where the 3309 peak starts to decrease and the 3232 starts to increase? So what's the temperature at which you might see these differences in the FTIR spectra? Mm -hmm. So we've done, a, we've done a fair amount of experiments um, on Mozambican rubies where we did it in controlled environments. Um, and I believe we've started seeing this as soon, as low as 600 degrees. But if you go to GIA's website and you look for, uh, if you just Google GIA low temperature treatment of Mozambican rubies, you will find two articles, two PDFs that are available for free that go much deeper into this treatment and really specify the conditions of our experiments. So you can see the changes in the ruby at the different temperatures that we've treated. So you can really find the details in those articles. We had another question, um, which is that with the flux treatment, one person asked, what would happen if you added uh, powdered corundum to the flux that you're putting on the surface of these stones? Would that uh, provide a better healing of those fractures with the flux? Absolutely, that makes sense. Like if you pre-charge your flux with corundum. It means that it has more corundum available to fill those fractures. Um, 
so yeah, that would make sense. I am not aware of people doing that routinely, um, but it is certainly a possibility. We had a couple questions sort of regarding um, potential identification of flux or maybe glass filling with the, the naked eye. Would you be able to kind of identify a stone that had been flux or glass seal just by looking at it? Could you see those fractures and differentiate them from a natural stone with the naked eye? Um, I think trained people can, can do it for glass filled rubies because usually glass fill, a lot of glass filled material, um, it is at the lower end of the spectrum. So those are usually bigger crystals, but of lower quality. Um, which makes that they have very big facets. So those contrasts within a facet are very obvious. I've seen a few cases that I've been able to spot a blue color flash when someone was wearing that ruby on his hand. Um, but generally, I would always advise loop the stone and then you'll be, you'll be very sure in the case of flux healed rubies and glass filled rubies. Um, traditional treatment is much, much more challenging, but flux healing, if you loop it, you'll be able to see it. Glass filling, you might be able to see it with the naked eye, but still to be sure, loop it, check the surface, maybe check the internal world, and then you'll be sure. Now, sort of as a follow-up to that, um, one question here was, you mentioned you know, there's this flux healing and there's lead glass filling, where the lead glass filling is less durable than the flux. So one question was, well, why would anybody lead glass fill your ruby if you could just flux heal it and get the same result? Or can you get the same result in every case from flux healing um, that you would get with lead glass filling? True. Yeah, not all the material reacts the same way. First of all, you need to consider the size of your fractures. I think it speaks for itself that if you have a very thin fracture, it is much easier to heal. If you have very wide fractures, it is going to be virtually, it's going to be theoretically possible to heal those. But in practice, it's going to take so long, it is going to consume that much flux um, that it is practically impossible. Um, you also have to consider that flux treatment is done at very high temperatures. Um, so if you have stones that uh, do not react well to these high temperatures, flux healing is already um, partially excluded because you need to go to these high temperatures and not every stone reacts the same way to those temperatures. Um, so it, it depends on the rough, on the state of the fractures, um, which fracture, which treatment is going to be more optimal. Generally, if there's a limited amount of fractures that are very fine, very controlled, people will go for flux healing. But if the material has a lot of fractures, big fractures, um, and doesn't react well to high temperatures, people tend to go for glass filling. Okay. Now, do you ever see this type of glass filling um, or even the flux healing in blue sapphires or is it only in rubies? Um, I mean, it's possible in all kinds of corundum because this has nothing, this has nothing to do with the color of the stone, but I have, seen cases of flux healed sapphires, but they're, they're extremely rare compared to the amount of flux healed rubies. Lead glass, uh, lead glass filled sapphire is more and becoming more and more available, especially with these colored glasses where they can add blue glass to enhance the color. So we've seen, I've seen basically every color of the rainbow in those glass filled sapphires but still the treatment was mainly developed on rubies. We still see it most on rubies, but I have seen yellow, orange, green, and blue sapphire lead glass filled. Um, and why is that? Is that just because of the difference in the value of the stones in the market that you, no one would take the time to fill a sapphire or what's the, the reason behind that? That might be one reason, but I think it is mainly with the available rough. Um, because there is a lot of lower grade ruby rough available, especially out of places like West Africa, um, Madagascar, that is very suitable for that lead glass filling. And it is not the case for uh, sapphire. The sapphire material that comes out um, in lower grades is usually not that suitable for lead glass filling. So just the amount of rough available 
uh, the amount of rough that that is working for these treatments, Ruby is just way more common than the other ones. Okay. Here's a, another in interesting question by Janice Snape. Um, she asked, if you could remove bluish areas from a Ruby, uh, could you theoretically take a blue stone, a blue sapphire, and turn it colorless or maybe purple or pink by just continuously heating it? How far can you go with moving that color? Um, well, all of that depends on the stone. All of that depends on your heat treatment because, um, yes, you can remove blue components from your stone. Um, we've seen, like I've shown that in the Mozambican ruby where they remove that subtle blue, blue zone. So yes, you can turn a pale blue stone under the right treatment conditions. You can turn it colorless. An overly bl dark blue stone, like a really dark blue sapphire, you can lighten that color so you can remove some of that blue. But I think it's, it's very different processes that are, are at work there. So I think that's something that we'll just try to discuss in more depth if we, uh, when we do a talk about sapphire treatments. Yeah, there's, uh, maybe we'll have time for a couple more questions. Um, a few people asked a similar question, which is, could you operate one of these furnaces under vacuum so that you could um, take lead glass filled rubies and remove those bubbles, make them less obvious? Again, yeah, probably yes. But at the same time, you're limited by your technology here because you're working at very high temperatures. You're working at 1,600, 1,700. So yes, there are going to be furnaces available where you can control your atmosphere, where you can control it. But those are going to be so much more difficult to operate, so much more expensive. Um, that it is simply not worth the cost for the heat treaters. So people use these electric ovens because they're very easy to build, very easy to maintain, very easy to operate, and they have a very high loading capacity. There's a lot of ruby you can stuff in there in one run. Um, while those more, let's call them precision furnaces, where you can control those pressures, so you could go to, you could work at a lower pressure, you could work at vacuum. Yes, those are available but those are gonna be for more specialized um, applications and gonna be much more expensive, much harder to operate. Okay. Now, as a final question, if you'll humor me, it's my own question. Um, I really like your photos of like the, the, the oil barrels that they're using for heat treatments and then the guys with the, the blow pipes and then all the way into the modern day with these, um, these electric furnaces and all this stuff. So um, I guess my question is, you know, in these treatment centers like Chanaburi, what does it actually look like? What's, what's the current state of affairs? Are people still doing this blowpipe stuff or is it mostly these induction furnaces? Um, what does modern Ruby treatment look like these days? I think um, speaking for Chanaburi in Thailand, um, I think it's safe to say that almost everyone made the step to those electrical furnaces because they are much safer to operate. Operating costs are much lower, they're much easier to handle. Plus you can do a lot more with them. Um, so a lot of people stepped away from those diesel powered, coke, uh, cokes powdered um, furnaces. Um, you might be able to find one or two there in operation. I've heard that on the Cambodian side of the border because um, the Thai ruby deposits are on the border of Thailand, Cambodia. On the Cambodian side of the border, there are still a few of those old school furnaces uh, in operation. Um, now the traditional Sri Lankan technique with the blowpipe, there's still a few guys doing that. Um, I think they made, there's a few specialists that control this very well and they do house calls. So they come to your house, they do it there. It takes anywhere from one hour to nine hours depending on the stone. So there's a few guys still doing that. But even in Sri Lanka, most people made the step to more modern furnaces, electric furnaces, or a gas power furnace that is typically used in Sri Lanka for sapphire treatment, a furnace that we'll definitely talk about if we do a sapphire talk. All right. Thanks, Gwyn. So thank right. you everybody else for joining us. Um, I think we've run out of time for questions, but if you have more questions, please join us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And we wanna also announce next week, we'll be having another webinar 
featuring Dr. Sally Magania, and she'll be talking about natural blue diamonds. So please join us again next week for another great webinar. Thank you everyone for joining. I hope everyone has a great day.